For Kuma Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Shomulikai, multi-award winning journalist, media and communication practitioner, Lebohang Siale joins me to unpack his book titled 100 Years of Dispossession, My Family's Quest to Reclaim Our Land. Welcome, Lebohang. Thank you, and uh, uh, thank you indeed for having me. It's a pleasure. You have written a personal account of the impact of the country's fading land reform policy on ordinary people desperate for land restorative. So can you tell us what inspired you to pen this book? Okay, yes. You know, I would say at least from an African perspective, if you are this child in the family and uh, its wider community, as in ours, and then you are only one of the few that had been to school up to university level, and then you have this big elephant that is the land that has not been returned to the community after the dispossession and the forced removal. And I thought, what would be the best way to honor and uh, pay back uh, the family and the community? I thought the return of the dispossessed land was the ultimate way to do that. And also, because when the community gathered uh, and the family, whether it was funerals or any other celebratory occasions, and then people will be uh, gathering in small communities and they will mm -hmm. be reliving their memories on the farm. Some of the stories were painful, some were delightful, but I thought those stories were nevertheless beautiful, worth telling. And uh, writing this book, I thought, was the, the way to go. <laughs> and talking about forceful removal, can you tell us more on how your family's land was dispossessed and how your family was forced out of it in a labor tenancy system? Oh, yes, that. I think uh, having done research and then uh, having gone back to the elders to try to piece together all the relevant information, so the land was dispossessed from us in the uh, mid 1920s. My grandfather was a chief on the land. We are part of the Balovedu royal uh, clan. And uh, so my grandfather had been the chief there. So these uh, white people just came and then uh, it was an arbitrary and capricious takeover. They just come and then from nowhere, from far off places that we didn't know, and they say, this land belongs to us, okay? And from tomorrow, you're going to start working for us. Mm. And uh, uh, at the time, it might seem strange now, but at the time, uh, the situation and the circumstances were quite different because uh, uh, white people were too powerful at the time, and then people felt powerless and helpless, so they just gave in to such a demand and they started toiling on the farm, uh, working for many hours for literally no nothing. So it was kind of a slave-like conditions at the time. Nothing short of serfdom that you have heard about in the feudal system. Uh, working long hours, uh, sometimes stretching over six months or even up to a year for a pittance. And it was not even most of the time in hard cash. It was just uh, what is called payment in kind in a, in a way. You work for staying on the farm mm. and then uh, for the few crops that they produce for you because you'll be allocated a piece of land near your household and then uh, they plow for you and then uh, as a result it is said that you are paying for living on the farm. That is the serfdom and the slavery that I'm talking about. Hmm. Also, Lebogang, tell us about the land claim your family and the community lodged in December 1998. And now that more than 25 years later, there is nothing to show for. Yeah, that is uh, something that is very painful because we were among the few communities that were able to lodge our land claim in 1998. That was the first time communities could lodge land hmm. claims in South Africa. And then uh, there was a lot of hope. People were excited at the time, especially because about three years later, our land was verified. And then it was said that uh, we had a valid claim and that we had a prima facie case. 
uh, that uh, if this matter went to court, will get back the land. So ordinarily, as you can imagine, people were very excited about this. Uh, there were a lot of hopes and all of that. But a uh, few years down the line, then things got complicated. A lot of mm -hmm. promises, no delivery of the land. And then now, 26 years later, the community, the family, we are still waiting for the land that never comes. And, uh, and then what is painful about it is that you watching as these elderly people who are really the people that we want to honor mm -hmm. by returning the land and dying while waiting for the land. And some of those people that have died are the founding members mm -hmm. of the land claim. And then each life lost, it's a heartbreak because, you know, imagine the excitement of giving back land to this person while they are still alive. So all of that is taken away. Mm -hmm. And now we are left in the limbo, left in the lurch. We don't know whether we'll ever uh, get back this land that was proven to be ours at the time. From our side as family, we believe we've done everything we want and that if this matter were to go to court, we are very confident that uh, this land can return. But the government keeps dithering and dilly-dallying mm -hmm. over this matter, almost like they're playing marbles with the community. Mm -hmm. As I indicate in one of the chapters, mm -hmm. uh, making a mockery of a land claim project in South Africa. And in one of the chapters, you talk of the tree that would never die. So can you tell us about the comparison you are making between your community's history and that of the tree? Well, right, yes, that chapter. <laughs> Um, you know, again, um, and at least from an African perspective, uh, you know the meaning of land. Human history is anchored on the land. Uh, everything is connected to and centered around the land. The uh, trees, the mountains, the valleys, the river, your life is connected to those things. Um, land gives you rootedness. It gives you a sense of identity and uh, I would say sanctity and also it gives you dignity. So there is inherent connection between the physical features of the land and the tree is among them. Uh, I can also talk about the grass. You know, when you are on the land, when there is a wind, blowing and the, you hear the grass rustling it's almost like the 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 grass is calling mm -hmm. and uh, and the trees when it's it's like it's talking to you so it's something sacred something holy that connects you to the land in a very deeply spiritual manner so when we were there revisiting the farm after many years and then so it was one of those moments when you felt that you were deeply connected to the land through this tree because this tree is not just an ordinary tree it is next to where our household was located and then this tree had been chopped down at some stage but uh, it sprouted again like uh, refusing to die as i say because it i felt like the way it had sprouted uh, it was uh, refusing and uh, this tendency uh, of wanting to wipe out our history from mm. the farm and then trying to maintain that heritage as well. And government adopted several interventions to support the acceleration of land reform programs and previously blamed conflict among land claimants high prices charged by white land owners and long delays in researching land claims as some of the reason mm -hmm. accounting for the protracted delays in finalizing restoration cases. So do you think government lacks ideas and the political will to resolve the land issue? Uh, thank you for that question. And I think as a community, we were quite alert to uh, challenges like uh, conflict among land claims over uh, one or two portions of land where you have got more than one claimant on one land, uh, counterclaims. So we were worried at some stage 
in our community because the uh, Mujaji Royal House tried to incorporate our land claim into theirs mm -hmm. so that, you know, almost like we're their subjects, but they're claiming the land on our behalf. You can say something like, uh, you can compare it to in Gonyama Trust, mm -hmm. Gonyama Trust in KZN. Uh, so we didn't want that. And we made sure that we managed that process. We ended up paying them a visit and then pleading with them to allow us to reclaim our land independently because we didn't want any conflict whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But then all of that had been cleared and we even had the letters from the traditional authority that we could claim independently from them. So we were again elated that uh, that paves the way for us to get back this land. But still, here we are. I, I'm, I'm talking about something that might have happened maybe 13 years back when we cleared the way mm -hmm. with the traditional authority. But here we are still waiting for the land that never comes. And there is a reason for that. It's squarely on the part of the government because mm -hmm. you are asking about the government. For me, it is not that government uh, doesn't know what to do about the land question. They just confusing themselves, but clearly the constitution is clear about, uh, for an example, issues of expropriation without compensation. It provides for that, for an example, land that has, was acquired through criminal uh, means, land that is line fellow, and so forth. But there is just lack of political will on the part of government. All we see is the grandstanding and the rhetoric around the land reform in the process re-inflicting the pain on communities. It's like our new government, the people who are supposed to be liberating us are the ones who are repossessing the land and then re-inflicting the pain on us as communities and families. Mm -hmm. And what do you think are the challenges facing land reform in South Africa and how is this affecting the economy? Okay, yes. Uh, I think, uh, uh, again, I'm going to lay the blame squarely on the part of the government. Firstly, uh, I think it is important to highlight that uh, when land reform was initially initiated, in the mid-1990s, uh, following the arrival of democracy in South Africa. It was not set up in such a way that um, proper research could be done around the matter. The land claims commissions were not properly uh, equipped and set up in such a manner that they were competent enough to do this matter. But also, government itself ended up coming up with a lot of conflicting messages around this thing. I'm going to tell you an example. While we were still waiting for the land, around 2014, uh, under the then president, Jacob Zuma, government decided that they were going to reopen another window to allow for new claimants. And then that happened. Suddenly, there was a whole flurry of uh, land claims that came while we were still waiting. Think of yourself, you're still waiting for your land and suddenly there are many more land claims mm. that are coming through while you're still waiting. Not just that, but uh, uh, I think about two years later, about former minister William Quinty, they decided that they were going to predate the uh, cut-off date for uh, claiming the land before 2013. That also kind of complicated the situation. We're watching all of that with a lot of uh, consternation and a lot of anxiety. Uh, we were lucky that the Constitutional Court put the brakes on that window, the new window that um, Jacob Zuma had provided at the time. But the challenge, once again, is that there's a lack of political will. They know what they can do, but they are conflicted and one of the problems why they are conflicted is because of greed and uh, avarice and corruption because you have what is called the emergence of the uh, what is called elite capture of the land high-ranking politicians who have been found to have usurped land that actually belongs to land claimants and communities 
but now they end up getting this land for themselves and their friends. Again, even the constitutional imperative like land reform, that is an emotive issue, has not been spared the vices of corruption, avarice, and so forth. And that is the real challenge with South Africa's land reform project. Well, there are anxieties that it is, uh, might disrupt uh, food production and all of that. Uh, but the constitution is clear where you need to protect private property, property rights, and all of that. Uh, that uh, it is not just going to be a wholesale expropriation of land without compensation, without due regard for property rights. So it's on the part of the government why we still in the limbo waiting. And lastly, Lebohang, what do you think is your book's unique contribution on the issue of land in South Africa? And also, what are you hoping people take away after reading your book? Yes, um, I think it is uh, important to highlight that uh, in recent years there has been a proliferation of books that have been written on land reform, and good books, by the way. Uh, however, one might say that uh, most of the books tend to dwell a lot on um, policy and the legislation that underpin uh, this matter. Uh, however, this one is unique in the sense that uh, it uh, combines and weaves personal stories into policy and legislation issues so that it is easily relatable to the reader and then they can vividly uh, connect these issues and then uh, if there is any book that offers a classic example of a failure of land reform in South Africa I believe it is this book is a classic case study into the failure of land reform in South Africa because it also brings the emotional aspect with the intellectual aspect in relation to policies and the legislation. And uh, the setting for the book is in one of the places that is prime agricultural environment uh, where you have powerful farmers who, because of their power and close connection, to uh, some of the hierarchy politicians, then it's almost like they are in cahoots uh, to frustrate the process, probably because they are powerful, rich, commercial farmers. But not only are they in, in cahoots with the politicians, but with the traditional leaders as well. You see them whining and dining in exotic locations and they even post on social media. And then these are supposed to are your public representatives. I'm not saying people should not meet, wine and dine, but you can't help asking yourself, what about the land? So that is the real issue. And I think that is uh, how unique this book is. Thanks a lot, Lebohang. <laughs> Thank you. That was Lebohang Seale speaking to Criminal Media's Polity about 100 years of dispossession.